Big game this week for Jimbo and the Aggies trying to save some face before jumping into SEC play. After losing at home to App State, they host the U at 9 Eastern on Saturday. Haynes King, uh, not a good start at quarterback. Threw for just 97 yards last week. That was after throwing a couple of picks in the win over Sam Houston State in week one. Aggies still ranked, but they won't be if they don't win this one. And then they have to play Arkansas in uh, Jerry World at Arlington. Then they got to go to Mississippi State, then Alabama and uh, South Carolina before taking on Ole Miss. It's a gauntlet, so they better get this one. All right, let's get Chip Patterson in here. He's got bold predictions for week three in college football. What's your bold prediction for that one in College Station? I think that Jimbo Fisher will have to bench Haynes King at quarterback and go to another option if Texas A&M is going to have a chance to win. Uh, You've got two options, Max Johnson, the transfer from LSU, Connor Wegman, uh, the youngster who was recruited to be the future of the Aggies quarterback position. But Haynes King has not done a good job of taking care of the ball. He has not done a good job of bringing some effectiveness to the passing attack. And I do think that as the pressure starts to mount in this game that I think will be a little bit low scoring, that I do think will be a little bit of a grind, we will see Jimbo Fisher have to get a little bit desperate. He already said this week that they are, quote, evaluating everything, including the quarterback position. And I think that as he puts together his game plan, something that is more of a team effort that he puts together with his assistants, Daryl Dickey, James Coley, and the rest of the offensive staff, I think that they're gonna be looking to try and see, okay, if Haynes King gets off to a rough start, Who are we going to be going to? Is it going to be Max Johnson? Is it going to be Connor Wegman? Who that is, I do not know yet, Chris. But what I do know is that Miami's defense, led by Kevin Steele, is going to be tough enough to create that situation of desperation. I think that Haynes King will be benched in favor of either Max Johnson or Connor Wegman on Saturday night. Three and one as a starter, but as you saw with the numbers there, he has yet to beat a team with much of a pulse. This would be a a, a huge feather in his cap if he can get it done this week. But Chip thinks he's going to be benched. All right, on CBS, we have Penn State going to Jordan-Hare to face the Auburn Tigers. Barrett Salee said yesterday with you and me that it's going to be the toughest environment a Penn State team has ever seen, Chip. I think that might be a little bit far. Jordan Hare is magical, and it can be very intense. But I think the, uh, you know, ethereal vibes around that place don't necessarily match up with the 100,000, you know, the cathedrals that you've got in the Big Ten, especially when it gets rocking. But I do think that this is going to be a stadium that is going to come alive in a way that brings out some old habits from Sean Clifford. Clifford is a sixth year player. He's someone who you would think is gonna be able to overcome this raucous environment in Jordan Hare Stadium. But some of the same things that we have seen from throughout Clifford's career, where there's you know, red zone turnovers, poor play in key situations, you know, the zero touchdown, two interception performance against Iowa. You know, those sort of ghosts might start creeping up here as uh, Sean Clifford at Purdue Yes, he showed some good, but he also showed some bad in that performance in that win in West Lafayette. I think that Auburn's defense and the Auburn environment is going to bring out some of the uh, old demons for a Sean Clifford player who you would think has moved beyond those turnover issues on the road. Chip, Auburn is 46-1 in their last 47 non-conference home games. Their only loss was to number two Clemson back in 2016, but... It's pretty rare when a team of Penn State's stature plays a non-conference game at Auburn, correct? I think we see it more and more, and this is also important to remember. It was 28-20 to when these two teams played in Happy Valley last season. Both of them finished right around 500, so if we're going to flip the environment and all of a sudden take this thing to Jordan-Hare, you know, what's to say that they don't have the book on what it's gonna take to limit Penn State's offense, to keep Penn State's offense under 30, to be able to cause real problems for Sean Clifford. Again, super competitive last year at Penn State. I do think that we'll see a similar situation in the SEC on CBS Game of the Week, a very competitive game in an awesome environment. Jordan Hare Stadium will be a key factor in this game, especially for Auburn's defense. Chip, how much hate mail have you gotten over the years for for not bowing down to the Auburn fans and pronouncing it Jordan Hare? 
Not much. Not that, not too much. Listen, I, I do have my fair share of upsetting fan bases across the country on the Cover 3 podcast, but uh, I, I, I at least get seem to get a free pass with that one. Defiantly calling it Jordan Hare time and time again. You'll get, you'll get a piece of hate mail from me. Just, just, just <laughs> you wait. All right, so you think that uh, Jordan Hare is going to wreck Sean Clifford. What about the rambling wreck of Georgia Tech going up against the lane trains from Ole Miss? Georgia Tech ain't even going to get double digits. This is one of the most slept on storylines going into this weekend. We spend all this time looking at Ole Miss and we're talking about Jackson Dart and Luke Altmyer and all of the transfers on the offensive side of the ball and Lane Kiffin won't tell us who's going to start. We should be talking about that Ole Miss defense that has also been replenished with transfer talent. And the way that the Rebs have been playing on the defensive side of the ball is absolutely elite. I think that that is one aspect of this Ole Miss team and the way that they're going to approach this season that we're not quite ready for yet just because we got so used to Matt Corral and the high flying offense. But defensively, Ole Miss, with all this transfer talent, is really playing well. And Georgia Tech, I do not have a lot of confidence in their quarterback, Jeff Sims. They have lost some of their key offensive players. Obviously, Jameer Gibbs off to Alabama to be the Crimson Tide's new starting running back. And so I think that Ole Miss goes into this game and they hold Georgia Tech to single digits in Atlanta for a road win as Ole Miss continues to fly somewhat below the radar, but continues to improve throughout the season. The total in that game is 63 and a half. So are you, are you really blasting the under? I'm doing the Georgia Tech team total oh, under okay. 23 and a half. Uh, and the Cover 3 podcast, which is on Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, went live with our locks. You will find that that is a lock and a lock agreement as the Ole Miss defense continues to be uh, a, a part of that profile and a part of that program that I think is very, very much underrated and overlooked. So we've got a chance to capitalize. Again, that's a little freebie. Go listen to the Cover 3 podcast for the rest. That is the Georgia Tech team total under 23 and a half. My bold prediction is they ain't even getting 10. Mm, all right, let's move on to a, a ranked on ranked matchup. BYU just beat Baylor. They're an underdog at Outson against the Ducks, who have not beaten an FBS team yet this season. Yeah, I think that BYU is really going to expose this Oregon defense. You look at the players on the depth chart and their recruiting rankings, and you think that this Oregon defense is going to be a really, really strong unit. And we've got, you know, Dan Lanning showing up, the former defensive coordinator from Georgia. And that, that he's going to come in and he's going to take all this talent and they're going to have great results. Well, obviously, you can't judge everyone by how they do against Georgia, but the Bulldogs ran right through this Oregon defense, threw it all over the yard on them. And I think that even going back last year to look at Oregon's defense, for all the four-star and five-star talent that they've got, they were very middling, gave up about five and a half yards per play on the season. That's like fifth or sixth in the Pac-12, not really great. And I just think we're so blinded by some of the recruiting success that Mario Cristobal and his staff had in Eugene that we assume that this Oregon defense is going to be really tough at the line of scrimmage. And I think what they are going to run into is a battle-tested BYU team. Uh, BYU also should be getting back Gunnar Romney and Puka Nakua, their top two wide receiver options, who did not play in the win against Baylor. I'm a little bit concerned, you know, if you were to go on the, the total or the pick of this game, because BYU might be a little beat up. Baylor was able to run the ball right at them. But the one aspect of the head-to-head -head between BYU and Oregon I feel the most confident in is that Oregon's defense – overrated BYU is just getting better even after the win against Baylor one more bold prediction from Chip Patterson before we let you go Virginia is hosting Old Dominion I don't know if you've seen it on social media yet but it blew up last night Hudson is the puppy dog that is the mascot for Old Dominion he's a little golden retriever and Virginia has said that he is not allowed on the sidelines of that game might there be a little karma coming their way on Saturday Justice for Hudson is just another storyline that goes on top of what I had already identified as an upset spot. Old Dominion already beat Virginia Tech, and I think that Virginia 
based on what I've seen so far, is in for a little bit of a step back season in year one under Tony Elliott. That's not specifically a reflection of Tony Elliott or his future with the Wahoos, but just the fact that they lost a lot of talent to the transfer portal. And while they do return Brendan Armstrong, uh, I think that the offensive fit is not the same as it was when they had Robert Anai in there as the offensive coordinator under Bronco Mendenhall. So we've got a Virginia rating that is not quite adjusted to the step back that I'm expecting. And ODU under Ricky Ronnie is a team that plays with a lot of attitude and plays with a lot of fire. This game means so much to the Monarchs. They know what it's going to take to be able to win those in-state recruiting battles. And it means getting these victories against their ACC in-state foes. I think that Old Dominion, just like it did against Virginia Tech, will now go on and take down Virginia, adding to what is becoming an absolutely sensational season in the Sun Belt. ODU, like Marshall, just arriving from Conference USA and uh, making the Sun Belt look very, very good here in 2022. So listen, I was in on the ODU play when I, I sent in my answers. And when I found out about justice for Hudson, then I, I only felt more confident in the Monarchs' motivation. Hudson, the, the poor little puppy dog mascot for the ODU Monarchs, not allowed on the football field at Virginia. Karma coming your way. Chip Patterson with bold predictions for week three in college football. He gave us a little tease for the Cover 3 podcast. He's got his locks along with the rest of the crew. And one of those big ones is the team total for Georgia Tech under 23 and a half. He doesn't even think Georgia Tech gets the double digits. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.